Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Facet Summit 2016. We are live and ready to go. So I'm just going to type that quickly in our Tazzle box so everybody knows. Oh, and apparently I can't type right now. My name is Naomi Hartle, and I'm part of the Fizetagogy and Fizet Summit team. And we just want to thank you all for jumping in on a Saturday and, you know, getting some amazing professional development from some amazing presenters. The caliber of presenters that we have for this conference is absolutely crazy, and we're so excited to have everybody with us today. If this is your first time jumping in, you are in the Tazzle right now. There is a chat function. We would love for you to kind of do the back channel and have conversations and ask questions because we will save some time at the end for you to ask um, Dr. John some questions and, and get some things going with him and kind of pick his brain on some things that he's going to talk about today. Also, if there are any tech issues for any reason that we jump out and you can't see us, just try and refresh that screen. If the refresh doesn't happen, it's probably something on our end. And what we'll do is we'll make sure that we get a new hangout going. We'll put that back in the Tazzle. So just stay in the Tazzle. Um, we'll make sure that we're in that back channel letting you know what's all going on. So that being said, oh, one more thing. We do have a feedback survey. And in order to get your certificate of attendance, we ask that you fill in that feedback survey. So if you want to get one for just the session, you can go in. It's on the website right now. You can fill that out, get it for the session, or wait until the very end where you watch as many sessions as possible and get that all on one certificate together. That being said, John, I will push it to you, and uh, we'll get your screen shared. Thank you. I'm going to try that again. <laughs> Perfect, it's up. All right, I'll mute myself. Thank you, Naomi. Um, hi, everybody out there. It's really strange that I'm talking in a quiet room and I can't see or hear anybody. So <laughs> I'm gonna hope that you can uh, you follow along well and I won't uh, go too fast or try to lose anybody. Um, it's really quite an honor to be asked to do this and I'm really excited to talk to you this afternoon, at least afternoon my time, about physical literacy and global development in children, which is, um, has become really in the last couple of years a, a real passion of mine. And I'm really happy to share with you not only some background ideas, but also um, some preliminary research that we have coming out of our lab um, on the relationship between physical literacy uh, interventions, physical literacy-based interventions, and uh, really cognitive development and, and pre-literacy development in children. So um, I won't spend too much longer on this slide just to say that I, I am still the director of INCH and connected to Family Medicine at McMaster University, but, but as of last month, I'm now a professor in the Faculty of Kinesiology and Physical Education at the University of Toronto. So I just got more titles and more locations, and I'm sure more meetings that will go with that. Uh, so I want to talk to you about three ideas um, regarding physical literacy in the early years and why I think physical literacy, why I think we really need to reposition physical literacy a bit um, in this space to make it more accessible to um, the target audiences that we're trying to reach, in particular parents and, and, and educators. And, and, and when I say educators, not only teachers, but also senior administrative educators who are responsible for budgets and curriculum and things like that. So we all know that, that physical literacy provides the foundation for healthy, active living. We, we, we talk a lot about the relationship between physical literacy and the impact it has on physical activity, but it really does much more than that, and that's what I'm gonna to try to build the case for today, to show you that physical literacy is really about overall development, but particularly cognitive and social development. And I'd like us to start thinking or trying to, thinking about and trying to promote the idea that physical literacy really is synonymous with brain development when we think about the first six years of life. When we're doing physical literacy in early preschool and even kindergarten, what we're really doing is, is optimizing and supporting brain development. And if we think along those lines, then we can use physical literacy as an intervention, both for optimizing development, but I would also add to that, also identifying uh, neurodevelopmental problems or atypical development in children. I, physical literacy, to me, can be a powerful platform not only to improve the overall development and quality of life of children and, and adults and everyone, but in this early year space in particular, we can also use it to identify children who may be struggling in different developmental domains. 
And I think physical literacy can be a particularly powerful tool for that. So those are my, my three ideas. And now I'm going to set out to uh, convince you, if I haven't already done so, why I think these three ideas make, make a lot of sense. So I, I've been talking about the early years, and we, we generally, in the research literature and in education, think about early years as really the six the first six years of life, one month of age through through to six years of age. I'm going to focus mostly on two years of age and up. Uh, I, I mean, there's a lot to be said, and we can talk a lot about the importance of motor development and fundamental movement skill in the first two years of life. There's obviously a lot going on there, but it's really when children get a little bit older that we can start to develop more complicated fundamental movement skills. So I'm really going to be focusing on the two to three to six period. Um, we know from the literature that, that this is a rapid period of brain development for all children, and it really lays the foundation for long-term health and well-being. We also know, though, that the environmental influences in this period are critical. And what that really means is, while all this complicated brain development is going on inside the heads of children, it's the stimulus or lack thereof that they're receiving in the environment that really plays an important part in shaping that brain development. So, so much emphasis, whether it's uh, Clyde Hertzman's work or um, the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard, has really been putting emphasis on the idea that it's really important to optimize and stimulate in, a, in an appropriate way children in that particular early year period by, by providing warmth and love and support, but also inviting and in, uh, providing rather enriched environments that can enhance their overall brain development. This is not controversial in pediatrics and developmental psychology. This is a given now. This, this, this message has been well received and our job is to work on optimizing or creating those optimal environments so that children can thrive, not only now, but in the long term as well. So when we talk about physical literacy in the early years, I want to talk a little bit about basic to fundamental motor skills. Um, well, it establishes the basis for life, lifelong participation by building competence and confidence. And my goodness, it's got to be fun. I mean, I, I think this is true of any developmental period, but particularly in the first six years of life. The experiences and the, the opportunities that we give for children to practice their movement skills and participate in physical activity has to be done in a way that's developmentally appropriate. It has to be done in a way that catches them and keeps them lifelong. And, and that's really about positive affect and fun. And that's why I think physical literacy is so important in this context. So when we talk about fundamental movement skills, this will be review for, for most of you, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we do talk about gross motor skills like hopping, skipping, running, and ball skills, but we also need to think about balance in terms of static and dynamic balance, so, so balance when you're moving versus balance when you're stationary. I, I would add to that, though, and I think this is starting to become uh, well accepted within sort of physical, among physical literacy researchers, that the gross motor skills and balance are fine, but really we also want acrobatic skills to be developed in this period as well. So spinning, rotating, hanging upside down. Um, I would add to that the importance of rhythm, timing, and sequencing is another important part that we don't typically think of as part of fundamental motor skills or movement skills, but I think they should be. And of course, we should also not forget the importance of manipulative skills or fine motor skills because these skills are not only important uh, for physical activity and sport, but they're also important for school readiness. So being able to use your fingers and your hands, being able to sort, stack, uh, print, uh, you know, use, use uh, crayons and, 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 and scissors and other, thing, other manipulative objects is a really, really important part of early development. So when we talk about fundamental motor skills or movement skills, it's really all of these things together. Um, again, this is you know, just there to provide a kind of basic overview of, of what happens in terms of developmental stages. You can see that the first four months are really about belly and head control. As a child moves from five to 12 months, we move from crawling to standing to walking and balance becomes a really, really important part of the child's repertoire. In 13 to 17 months, it's, it's the further refinement of walking and balance. And by 18 months to three years, we start seeing running. And by three to six years, we, we really see that rapid progression from basic 
uh, to more fundamental movement skills of the kind we've been talking about in the last slide. So again, our focus is really going to be on the 18 months and up where the foundational movement skills that are required to do all of these other things in the first 17 months are really very, very basic. And I, I think from an intervention perspective, again, we can support a child's development here. Belly time is really, really important for, for infants. Uh, but this is, you know, from, from my perspective, when we start to get a little bit more complicated, then that's when we can really have some fun in the environment. So I mean, again, I assume most of you have a definition of physical literacy. We, we talk about it often in terms of having the requisite fundamental movement skills, but also the competence and confidence uh, to be physically active, to use those motor skills. And as I previously mentioned, it's got to be fun. There has to be a positive, affective engagement that's happening with children, uh, whether they're toddlers, infants, and children, right through to adulthood. Um, these are the core components of physical literacy. And if you're familiar with the long-term athlete development model, you know, they've got a really nice uh, pictograph here that sort of that, that emphasizes the point that if you don't have these fundamental movement skills, if you can't run, you're not going to be able to play basketball uh, and a whole host of other different kinds of sports. If you don't practice throwing, you're, you're, you're going to struggle when it comes to baseball and goal ball and, and, and football and rugby. And, and swimming, same thing, you're gonna be cut out of a lot of different sports. So we see this as really foundational to uh, long-term participation in physical activity and sport. Now it's interesting in the literature, um, there has been quite a lot of research that's looked at the association between fundamental movement skills and physical activity. And I have to say that when you, when you look at that literature, the first thing that you really notice is that it, it, there is certainly a correlation between having or not having fundamental movement skills early on in life and whether a child or an adolescent or a young adult is more active or less active later on. Um, but it's really not very much of an effect. From, from a research perspective, we would call it a kind of small to weak correlation. And it does look like there's some sex differences. So fundamental movement skills might be really important or more important for girls than it actually is for boys in terms of their participation. Um, so in some ways, the, the evidence isn't really overwhelming on the relationship between FMS and long-term physical activity participation. And that, that's, that might be a bit of a, of a concern to us, except that I would remind you all that we're actually not measuring physical literacy in these studies. We're measuring fundamental movement skills, usually using things like the test of gross motor development or the brunix osteretsky test of motor proficiency. These are tests of fundamental movement skills, mostly gross motor skills and balance. But if you think of the definition of physical literacy, it's much broader than that. We're not measuring with these tools the affect, the, com the competence, the confidence, all of the other psychological and social things that go alongside those motor skills. And it's our hypothesis, and Dean Creelers has some data to support this, um, that when you start looking at a broader definition of physical literacy and measuring it, you actually see much stronger correlations with physical activity than you do in, in some of this literature. So there's a small group of us, uh, Dean uh, among, among them, also Dean Dudley uh, from Australia, who are working on uh, taking care of the measurement piece and getting some tools out there so we can start to see studies that replicate the kind that are presented here, but focus on physical literacy rather than just FMS. So you've all heard the argument before for physical literacy that healthy active living uh, is, is, is kind of the goal, um, but I, I, the argument I'm advancing to you here is it's only part of it. Uh, we need to equate, as I've said, physical literacy with the found, as a foundation for healthy development. In particular, when we talk, when we, when we use this new term healthy development, it's not only healthy active living, it's brain development, physical health, social development, academic achievement, health promotion and prevention. So I want us to start thinking about physical literacy as a pro-developmental uh, tool, that we should be thinking broadly about development, not just in relation to healthy active living. So let's talk a little bit about you know, why we can make that link between physical literacy and brain development, talking specifically about cognitive development, social development, and, and school readiness. So there's actually quite a lot of literature out there already 
that shows a link between early gross motor ability and later cognitive ability. So children who are uh, performing better on tests of gross motor skill in infancy and in toddler periods and early childhood actually do better on cognitive ability tests later on in life as they go through middle school. So there's a, a longitudinal association between a child's early motor development and the development of their brain. And motor ability in children has been linked specifically to things like working memory. So again, more advanced or proficient motor ability is associated with better working memory. It's even linked, and I find this work to be particularly fascinating, to emotional recognition. Children who have uh, high levels of motor ability are also do better on tests, tests rather, where we ask them to judge facial expressions. So is this, is this facial express, uh, expression, for example, showing a child who's sad or happy or frustrated? And children who have better motor ability are better at those tasks than children who have less developed motor ability. We know also from the literature that poor motor ability has been found in children with a variety of different neurodevelopmental disorders or problems. So if we think about children with autism spectrum disorder, we see a higher rate of poor motor ability in children with that condition. We see the same thing for ADD and ADHD, language impairment, and even reading disability. So the logical question is, why? Why do we see this link? this correlation and sometimes a predictive correlation between early motor ability and all of these later cognitive and mental processing type outcomes. And there really is a compelling neurological psychological connection that I'm going to share with you right now. Um, for, before I go there, I want to talk about cognition because I've used that term and I haven't really done a very good job yet of defining it. What I mean by cognition in this context is a group of mental abilities related to things like knowledge, memory, reasoning, and problem solving. Um, you will often hear this described as aspects of executive functioning or cognitive control. And there's a growing literature in, in the exercise and physical activity literature that links physical activity, particularly aerobic physical activity, to improvements in cognitive ability, improvements in things like memory, reasoning, problem solving, and attention. And we see that in early adulthood through to old age. We have much less information, much less research on children, and in particular, very young children. But we do have a lot of emergent uh, literature in, in adolescence, early adulthood, and adulthood about the links between particularly, again, aerobic activity or exercise and cognitive ability. And I gave you one reference there by Chuck Hillman, who uh, is at the University of Chicago, or actually was at the University of Chicago. He's on the move right now. But um, cognitive control, as I mentioned a, a while ago, re really involves the following three things. So cognitive control is synonymous with executive functioning. So for those of you who are hot on executive functioning, then just, just pretend that you don't see cognitive control there and think executive functioning. It, it's the same thing. Um, what we're really talking about are inhibition and inhibitory control. So it's important that you're able to stay on task. It's really important, especially in an educational context, for a child to stay on task and ignore distractions in his or her environment. Working memory refers to the ability to hold information in your mind and manipulate that information. Um, so you really, it's really, some people think of work, working memory as sort of the core of cognitive control because it's how you hold information, process, and use information in your brain over short periods of time so that you can execute tasks. And cognitive flexibility is, is this switching between two different concepts or thinking about multiple concepts simultaneously. So I'm anticipating or trying to, trying to anticipate or decide what I'm going to say next to you right now and also starting to think about what I might make my kids for dinner when I go home. I can balance multiple things in my head at the same time and I can switch back and forth between concepts. That's, that's what we call cognitive flexibility. So if you go back to uh, early neuroscience and, and maybe even introductory psychology classes, they would tell you that executive control, executive functioning is all about that red region of the brain and what we call the prefrontal cortex. And specifically, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is where we associate anatomically all of those processes associated with executive functioning. It's a higher brain order and a higher brain 
uh, centers of our of our brain that we see this kind of, that, that we see executive functioning tasks going on. If you contrast that a little bit with the cerebellum, which for those of us who are interested in movement, we think about as really being the structure of the brain, that, that beautiful lattice structure in the brain that is responsible for motor control and balance and, and movement in general. It's sort of the command center for movement. That's sort of the historical division of these anatomical regions. The prefrontal cortex is about higher order thinking and cognitive ability, and the cerebellum is all about movement and more foundational fundamental things. And if you look a little deeper in that literature, um, the literature will say, well, you know, motor development, uh, the cerebellum is an older region of the brain than the prefrontal cortex. So motor development occurs much faster than, than cognitive development. That stretches right through into early adulthood, but really by, by, by eight years of age, 10 years of age, motor function is pretty much set. So the cerebellum is pretty much developed as, as much as it's going to develop. And that those two systems, the cerebellum, cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex, really develop independently. So there's different things happening at different times as a child is developing as their brain is growing. Well, that position is not widely held by uh, researchers anymore in neuroscience. We have an alternate view now, really courtesy of people like Adele Diamond, who really were the first to show that motor and cognitive development are really fundamentally intertwined. You can't separate them. And that's why we see those studies that I presented earlier that show a link between motor ability and all of those other aspects of cognitive ability, even emotional regulation or recognition. We see motor as uh, developing simultaneously, synergistically with cognitive development. You've probably heard the expression neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's a really important phrase to remember because what that says is that when we look at the brain under dynamic situations, either using ECG or brain imaging techniques, when we see different regions of the brain light up or fire, we see those neurons firing at the same time, then we know that those two parts of the brain or multiple parts of the brain are working in concert to achieve a goal. And so we know now from those kinds of studies that the cerebellum is important not only for motor function, but cognitive functions as well. And we know that there's co-activation, and we know this because there's co-activation. There's neurons firing together in both regions of the brain when a task is executed. Now, what does he mean by co-activation? And I want to try to sort of suss this out a little bit more for you. When we uh, give individuals, or children or adults, a variety of different tests, and I've picked three of them here, a verb generation task. So you ask a person to give a noun and then provide a related verb or a verbal fluency task. So we say in one minute, say as many words as you can that start with the letter F. Don't do this right now, you give yourself a headache. Or something like the Wisconsin card sort task where you sort cards by color, shape, or name, and then all of a sudden the experimenter does something nasty and says, okay, um, ignore color, just do it by name and you have to block out the color and focus only on the names to sort the cards. When we have people do these kinds of tasks and we hook up their brains to electrostimulant, electrostimulation capturing devices like ECG, or we put them under a big magnet and we look at what regions of the brain are firing, we see the cerebellum, particularly the neocerebellum, and that dorsal prefrontal cortex, that specific part of the prefrontal cortex, firing, working together, lighting up, showing that both these regions of the brain are involved when we do these kinds of tasks. Now note, there's no real movement in these tasks except for the card sort where there's a little bit of fine motor movement. So it's the cerebellum participating in a, what we think of as a classically um, cognitive-based task, a memory task or a fluency or verb generation task. We also know from other research that the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex form what we call a neural circuit. It's like a pathway. And it seems to be really important when there are cognitive test tasks that are demanding, that are new, that require this cognitive shifting or flexibility so it's not stable or predictable, it changes and it's complicated. When a task requires a quick response, like tell me quickly, one minute, how many words do you know to begin with F? requires attention or concentration, it's not an automatic response. The cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex are key when cognitive tasks have these kinds of characteristics. So that has led 
Um, and rest assured, I'm going to get through the neuroscience and not bore you anymore with this. But that has led neuroscientists to really hypothesize about what the role of the cerebellum might be in relation to learning. And there's a variety of different ones. We don't know yet which one it is, and maybe it's all of these things to a certain degree. The cerebellum might be a modifiable pattern detector, so it's really good at predicting, identifying patterns, and then using those patterns to predict future outcomes. It might be good at reducing error or detecting error from the mistakes that we're making and then uh, providing correction. And it might work to enable other parts of the brain to function more efficiently. So the cerebellum might be the master conductor that shuts down other areas of the brain or suppresses other kinds of function going on in different areas of the brain so the prefrontal cortex can work more effectively. We don't know, but what we do know is both of them are really, really important for learning. So let's think about this in terms of practical implications. Let's take this neuroscience and say, what can we do with this information? If the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex are really important for learning, then they're important for early development when we think about things like school readiness and general cognitive and social development. Yay for physical education in the early years. We need to be thinking about if it's about the cerebellum and it's so important and implicated in this development, and the cerebellum is classically associated with motor ability and movement skill, then we need to think about how do we use that to stimulate the development of the cerebellum and therefore we'll have these other positive uh, learning related outcomes. That coactivation, that stimulation of both regions of the brain, suggests that if we stimulate one area of the brain, we may be able to, 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 to lead to stimulation in the other. So we need programs that target both motor and cognitive function if we want to strengthen the connections between the cerebellum and the prefrontal cortex. And I have in brackets their intentional design, and that's where I think education becomes key here. How do we design programs that don't only stimulate motor ability that, that target the development of fundamental movement skill and physical literacy, but that are also cognitively demanding, so movement and thinking based paradigms. Um, I think that together, this targeting of physical literacy in this way, in this intentional way, is how we can achieve what I said earlier, have a broader impact not only on development, um, and not only on healthy active lifestyle, but really whole child or global development in children. So let's talk about intervention to identification or universal programs as response to intervention. This was my third idea. Uh, we need to, here's my proposal. We need to implement evidence-based physical literacy programs to all children in the first six years of life, particularly that 18 months and older, two years of age and up. We need to root it in the community and home-based programs because that's where a lot of kids are. They're not all in, they're not in school yet in many instances, although I think this is applicable in kindergarten as well. And we certainly need to embed physical literacy curriculum into, into kindergarten and really through all of school, but, but now we're focusing or we're focusing primarily on, on the early years. And following what we know about movement in the brain, programs that intentionally target multiple developmental domains, so movement and reading, will not only ensure wider acceptance and adoption by parents and educators potentially, but we're actually going to achieve that impact, that co-stimulation of brain regions that we think is so important in development. But here's the added benefit, and I mentioned this earlier. If we do this for every child, so it's a universal intervention, all children can benefit from receiving a phys an enriched physical literacy uh, programming in that first six years of life. Because we're focused so much on movement and a child's ability and the development of movement alongside cognition, we might at the same time create a more efficient system for identifying children with motor learning problems, many of whom uh, actually do have other kinds of developmental challenges. And we know from a whole different literature that it's really difficult to identify early children with autism or children with other kinds of neurodevelopmental problems like ADD and ADHD. I think if we do the physical literacy intervention, the universal intervention right, we might just be able to create a more efficient system for identification of children who don't seem to be progressing on their physical literacy journey. That's not to say that every child that isn't progressing has a serious condition like autism. 
there's many children who will simply be on a different path and slower to learn or develop in terms of physical literacy. But if we think of this in, an, in a universal way, in an enriched way, and a supportive way for parents and children, we should, through engagement, increase the likelihood that we're going to identify children who may need some additional support. And we've talked about this from a practical point of view, particularly to my medical colleagues and people who are outside of physical education and kinesiology. The great thing about a physical literacy-based intervention, particularly when we're talking about using it to facilitate the identification of children who have some developmental concerns that require a deeper level of support, the great thing about physical literacy programs, if they're designed right, is that they're fun. Most important thing, right? That they're non-threatening, that we're talking about play and encouraging and supporting active play with children. That it can be participatory, it can be child to child, it can be educator to child, it can be parent to child, it can be all three. And that these programs need not be expensive. That good, enriched physical literacy programs can be designed and implemented in a cost-effective way, potentially even in a cost-neutral way, depending on the system in which you work in. So I, I usually show this slide to try to induce a mild seizure. Um, I, I, there's a lot of arrows going back and forth between boxes here. What I want you to really focus on, though, are, and I've darkened the ones that just to make the point, that what we see when we talk about development, particularly atypical development, which just means that the child isn't on time or not developing at the same rate or is delayed in some way in a developmental milestone. And we think about the relationship between neurodevelopmental uh, disorders in later childhood, you know, four and six and seven year olds. When we look at the literature, what we see is that kids with autism, ADHD, developmental coordination disorder, which is a particular passion of mine, depression and anxiety even, when we go back and we look at their motor development, we often see signs of atypical motor development. They were perhaps appeared to be clumsy when they were very, very young, or they failed to meet certain motor milestones, or they were late in achieving motor milestones. And we see the same thing with speech and cognitive development and behavioral problems and difficulty regulating behavior. But why this is important is because motor, in this context, could be the canary in the coal mine. When we see children in that zero to three age range struggling or demonstrating atypical motor development, that may be the early marker that we're looking for that's related to problems later on in life. And that's my rationale for the universal physical literacy approach because it's all about targeting that uh, fundamental movement skill. Of course, I would add an enriched cognitively developmentally appropriate way. Uh, DCD is a, a great case example. Developmental coordination disorder, it's also known as dyspraxia or motor learning disorder. It was once called clumsy child syndrome. It has a prevalence of about 5% in North America. Um, but most children with DCD are not recognized until school, if they're ever recognized at all. And what our research and the research of others has shown that there are substantial personal, medical, and social consequences that go along with motor coordination difficulties or motor clumsiness. And if we don't intervene appropriately, these children are at greater risk for a lot of negative outcomes. It's really, really important, therefore, uh, that we design programs that allow us to identify children in ways that are universal. And, and my colleague Cheryl Mazuna and some of her colleagues here at McMaster have been working on one particular model for schools called um, Partnering for Change, where occupational and physiotherapists are put in schools to help support teachers who have questions about atypical motor development. If they see something in a child that's concerning, they have the opportunity to consult with an OT or a PT who doesn't pull the child out of class but works with the teacher to develop strategies to see if we can move the needle on that child's motor development. Maybe it's not a serious neurodevelopmental problem, it's just lack of experience or lack of opportunity to practice. And the OTs and the PTs are not there to test and to intervene, they're there to support teachers. And that, that model is universal design for learning type model or response to intervention model is what I have in mind for these early years physical literacy programs. Okay, so where is the evidence for all this stuff? Because that's a lot of theory. You know, show me the money. Uh, let's see what we have. Well, 
I said this once before, our brains produce electrical signals. When certain regions of the brain fire, we can put a, a, a crazy looking uh, a helmet on, on our, our study participants that capture these electrical signals and tell us which region, regions of the brains are firing when we do certain kinds of tasks. And we've used that methodology to look at the impact of physical activity, exercise, and I would go as far as to say we're starting to look more at physical literacy and rich kinds of activities in children to see what happens in terms of how their brains are firing. And, and probably most of you have seen this infographic before. Again, it comes from Chuck Hillman's work, but it's, it's about a, uh, it's a, it's an intervention study of children who were randomly assigned to an after school PA physical activity program versus kids that were on the wait list. And what we know for the children who participated in the physical activity program was that not only their fitness improved, but their cognitive performance improved, especially for tasks that involve executive functioning. And the brains on the, my left-hand side of the screen that have all the color, the red, the green, the yellow, what that's showing you is the areas of the brain that are firing for these children when they're doing different kinds of cognitive tests. In this case, switching tasks and flanker tasks, which were similar to the kinds of tests that I described earlier. Look at the brains of the children who weren't physically active. Only very small regions of the brain are lighting up. There's more cognitive activity going on in the brain in the children who got that physical activity intervention. I love this study by Lee Robinson because to me, this is getting much closer to my model of physical literacy. She did a similar study where they had, and this is with preschool uh, and kindergarten children, she did a study where they, she had a motor skill group, so a, a, a group that got fundamental movement skill based um, experiences and programming versus a group that were involved in sedentary activities. And if you look at the, the, the again, the left hand slide, the bars, what she was able to show was that sustained attention improved in children in the motor skill group. Now, I'm going to point out to you right now that even though the red bar is bigger, in, in this case, higher scores means worse function. So you want to see the blue group lower than the red group, and that's exactly what she was able to show, and it was statistically significant. Why I like this so much is because her motor skill intervention, I think, is really a physical literacy intervention. She just doesn't call it that. But when I looked at her curriculum and what she was doing, it was consistent with the tenets of physical literacy. So I find this really intriguing and very exciting. Uh, some of you may have heard of a program called Animal Fun. It was developed by a colleague of mine, Jan Pike, at, at, at the at Curtin University in Australia. It was designed for physical education, or sorry, it was designed for kindergarten teachers and preschool teachers. And the basis of the program is that kids learn different movement skills by mimicking animals in different play situations. I think this is a really unfortunate picture because I would really have liked to have seen that teacher standing up, not sitting down. But this particular activity was really about isolating the upper body and keeping the lower body stationary. There's many more activities in this, in this program that are much more whole body based and movement based. And pretty much like um, the other research that we showed, uh, the kids in the intervention group, which is the blue line, improved significantly over time in terms of their performance on a motor test called the BOT or the brunitz osteretsky test. The thing that was a little troubling here was that this was not a randomized group. So the control group actually started out a little bit better and, and they improved over time as well. So there's something happening with this program, but there was a, something kind of strange about the control group. So we need more research on animal fun, but I think as far as the activities go, they are consistent again with a movement skill based program, not necessarily a physical literacy enriched program. So let me tell you about move to learn because this is a program that we've developed in my lab that specifically targets motor and pre-literacy skills for children in that three to four year age range, which in the province in the country I live in are children who are in the preschool space. And the aim of the program was to develop fundamental motor skills and early language and reading skills by developing a program 
of activities and games that involved integrating parents and caregivers directly into the program so that they could participate and play with their children in our setting, but then go home and continue to do activities when they weren't in a highly structured setting with us. The project involved, and you can see the circle here, targets a number of different developmental domains. But the structure of the program was 30 minutes of direct fundamental movement skill instruction, which I know is controversial among some people when we think about early childhood education. Um, this is not skills and drills. This is fun games that we play with kids and parents and kids play together, but targeting specific fundamental movement skills. Then we give them a chance to play with whatever is there in the gym that day or the setting in any way that they want to. It's a true free play period. And in fact, we pull the parents away and have them do something different so the kids can play on their own. And then the final part of the program is a reading circle where kids and parents come back together. They're given a book and they read together as a group with a facilitator who is essentially coaching parents on how to effectively read to their children. We developed this program to, to be a run in East Hamilton, which where I am, which is a low income neighborhood. So these are families that don't necessarily have a lot of resources and aren't necessarily in programs. We wanted to provide them with an enriched experience. So again, as I've said, but an hour uh, in total, most of the time spent in fun games and activities that target fundamental movement skills in a physical literacy model. So again, it's about building competence and confidence and always looking to ensure that children are participating and having fun. And then the other half hour divided between free play and interactive storybook reading. They met on a Saturday morning for 10 weeks. I'm going to skip to the next uh, slide here, which just gives you a little bit more. I'm going to talk a little bit about the movement skill development program. You can see here that it's locomotor skills, object control, stability were the, the sort of main targets, the 50 minutes of free play. Um, but then the 50-minute the reading program, which may be somewhat new to some of you, was actually developed by um, a, a speech-language pathologist at, the, at Ohio State University, which is a very structured program that essentially coaches parents on how you get children to build print alphabet narrative knowledge, alphabet recognition, begin to connect story to pictures, the foundational pieces of what we call pre-literacy skills. Now the long-term goals of the program are simply that by targeting again those movement skills and pre-literacy skills, we think that we can move the needle in a positive way on physical activity, social skills, self-perceptions, and cognitive development, and that all those things together are part of overall healthy development and school readiness. But our focus is on that integration of games and activities with the pre-literacy enriched component. Uh, we're, we're researchers, so the way that we do this is we measure a whole lot of stuff at the beginning of the intervention, before the kids and parents start, um, after the program, and then five weeks later. And, and I, I realize now some of those acronyms will not be meaningful to you, but just as a, as a way of summarizing, we're measuring pre-literacy skills. We're measuring movement skills with the Peabody. We're asking parents about their level of engagement at home when they were asked to practice what was, pra what was introduced that week. And we interviewed them about acceptability and feedback, what they liked about the program, what they didn't like about the program. And here's what we found, which I think is quite um, intriguing. This was a pilot study. There were only um, 11 families in, 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 in the control group and, and nine families in the experimental group. Um, but what you see here is the, the control group are the, are the kids and the parents who didn't get the intervention. I should, I should have said earlier, this was a waitlist control design. So every family eventually got it, but we had a waitlist. So some got it earlier than others. And what we see here in the blue bars is just the significant differences in improvement in gross motor skill, in locomotor skill, and tremendous improvement in object manipulation over the period of the intervention. So this is exactly the kind of graph where we want to see those blue boxes is higher than the, the red boxes. There wasn't a lot of change happening for the kids that were on the wait list that weren't accessing the program. But for the kids that did, 
we saw positive changes in gross motor, locomotor, and object manipulation skills. Now, I should point out that these were not kids who had an existing diagnosis. So these were just typically developing children. And I think that's really powerful for our universal design statement. We believe this should be done with all children. And our work and Lee Robinson and other researchers have shown that you can take typically developing children and then put them in enriched environments that target movement skill development and they get better at it. This doesn't happen accidentally or naturally. Kids need the support to develop motor skills and that's what this graph and these programs and other research studies like them are showing. And look at the pre-literacy skills. Now, there wasn't a big difference in knowledge of the alphabet because most of these kids knew the alphabet already. But look at print awareness. Being able to identify letters and words is the foundational building block of reading. The kids in the experimental group who had the enriched reading circle where the parents were coached on how to read to their children got significantly better by the end in print awareness. So what have we done? We've targeted motor skill and we've targeted pre-literacy, which is part of that cognitive development, and we move the needle positively in both regards. This is just to give you an example of some of the activities, because I know there's a bunch of you out there wanting to know the details. What did you do with these kids? And we can share this information. We have a, uh, a, a, a manual that's been created that we are in the process of working on. That's why you see sample here. We want to be able to share this with whomever is interested in potentially running the program. But this is an example of week one, which was all about balance. So the head and shoulders, knees and toes, hokey pokey, all kinds of fun stretching activities. But then activities that target static balance, dynamic balance, and you finish it off with an obstacle course, with the, which kids, uh, in my experience, love, always love the obstacle course. And you can see specific examples of, of the activities there. I'm going to give these to Naomi, the slides, and she'll be able to post them so you can take a closer look at this um, when you have more time. So just to kind of sum up here, because we're getting near the end, um, physical literacy to me, and I'm sure to you, is more than just the foundation for healthy, active lifestyle or sport participation. Movement skills are associated with a wide array of developmental outcomes, including cognitive development. That's why it's so important for educators in the education system. We need interventions like Move to Learn and other programs, Lee Robinson's work, maybe Animal Fun, anything that we can put a physical literacy enriched lens to in this early year space. We need to develop those programs and we need to get out there and start uh, making sure that kids have access to this, both certainly in my country and, and possibly in yours too, if you think the value is there. On the research side of things, we need to always be working with you to make sure that we can produce the kind of data that I showed you here today, because I think that is so essential in the competitive and fiscally restrained environments in which we work. People want to know, if I do this program, what can I expect? What's the evidence that, that this is going to make a positive difference in terms of the child's development? And we're passionate in my lab about providing that kind of evidence. I think you guys out there are far better at developing, uh, developing new curriculum and programs and fun games and activities than, than, than I am. Um, but what we can bring to it is, is the focus on science and measurement so that we can show that the work that we're doing, why we believe this to be so important, is having a positive effect. If you want to know more about what we do, uh, go to the www.inchlab.ca and you can read a little bit there. Um, you can certainly contact me directly if you have any questions or, or you want to learn a little bit more. You can like us on Facebook and you can follow me on Twitter and all that other social media stuff. And as we continue to learn, as we do more research, we, we will continue to disseminate that information. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much for everybody's attention. That, that was amazing. Like, <laughs> I'm just like blown away by all the information. I'm like, holy moly, this is fantastic. Okay, so there was one question closer to the very beginning, and I'm just searching to find it. Okay, here we go. So what can we do with students who miss their window? Oh, I lost something. Who missed their window of opportunity during the first six years of their lives? How would you 
advise us to do motor, motor remedial teaching with them, if at all possible. And you can take the screen share off so then people can see you while you talk. Okay. Perfect. You really want to see me? It's, it's really disappointing. Actually. Uh, it's better than me. It's better than me. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. Um, first of all, uh, while I think the first six years are, are critically important, without question, uh, what we do know from, from neurodevelopmental um, research is that, that brain plasticity does not just occur in the first six years of life. It's an ongoing process. So there may be certain things. Uh, we certainly know with visual processing, for example, that if there's a, a problem in visual processing that's not identified early, it's unlikely that child will ever be able to see exactly the same way that you and I are able to see. Um, I think for windows in related, relation to things like proprioception, there are critical windows in the first six years which make it difficult to um, regain some of the things that are, that are lost if they're not stimulated early enough. But I fundamentally believe that it's never too late to do remedial motor programming with all children regardless of their age. What it means is it's probably going to take longer and you're going to have to work on different strategies. And it's really got to be child-centered. So it's really got to be working with children one-on-one, -on -one, figuring out what they're capable of doing, and structuring those motor learning experiences in a way that taps into, reaches those children. And then it's practice, 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 um, which can be really challenging, both for the educator and for the, the child. But I don't want you to walk away thinking it, it's all done if we don't do this by six years. It, it, it's going to be a lot harder, but that's why the six years are important. Let's do this earlier so we don't have to work as hard when children get older. That's so that's, I can just listen to you talk all day long. This is absolutely amazing information. Um, Lisa Berman has a question. What do you think will ultimately be the best way to get parents to know that children need these physical literacy skills? Would it be like a pediatrician visit? What do you think is the best yeah, way? It's a fantastic question. I'm not so naive to believe that just because we publish a research study that parents are going to say, oh, well, this has got to be what we do with our kids. But I think it's part of it. I think, I think part of it is, sh is not just showing the research study, but, but getting the message out via you know, the kinds of mechanisms that we use, whether it's social media or others. We need to really can get the message out that physical literacy is not just about activity and sport, it's about global development. And the evidence can, can be used to buttress that kind of, a, of, of an argument. Um, but you know, I, I think for most parents, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, in, in a simple 10-week program that was run in the community, the Move to Learn program, the parents, you know, I didn't show you the feedback, but the, parent, the feedback from the parents was amazing. Their kids were doing things they didn't think they were capable of doing. If you can have that moment of demonstration, look at what your child can do now, just from a little bit of instruction, um, and certainly they see the improvements in reading and other things quite dramatically, then I think the proof is in the, in the pudding, the proof is in doing. Um, but we've got to work together as educators, as researchers, as policy folks, to really push this idea. And I don't think we're there yet. I think there's a lot of attention to physical literacy, but there isn't in exactly the way that I'm making this case. And I think that's the piece that we, we have to build upon because I, I worry if it's always about the pediatric obesity problem, as important as that is, if it's always about that, we're gonna lose parents, they're gonna start to tune out. And of course, you, you, you must have got it by now that I think physical education is essential and I think it's essential not only in school age children, but in the preschool space. So we've got to do a better job at educating our preschool teachers, our care providers, and other people who work with children in this space about physical literacy and why it's an essential part of the developmental work that they do. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. So there's no other questions from folks unless, if folks, if you have any questions, ask now, here's your time. We have about seven minutes left. And as I said in, in the talks, I was like, here's your time to pick his brain, where you have him live. <laughs> you can get a live on-air answer. So definitely let us know. And uh, yeah, it's definitely an important topic um, that we are discussing and, and bring, like I had said before, this is a great platform to share with teachers that are in the grassroots, that are in the classrooms right now, that have access to pushing this out to the parents, right? It, you know, how do, we, how do we advocate? Well, it starts with us and, and what we're doing with our, our, our school systems, but then also how can we push that into the pre-K and elementary and get our parents involved and really understanding what it is they need to be doing to support, you know, the child's physical literacy journey. So um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. And to those of you that came out today, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate it. John, again, thank you so much 
for sharing your knowledge and your expertise in, the, expertise in this topic. We really appreciate you taking your time. I know it's been a busy day for you, so we will let you go here right away. Um, folks that are out there, feedback survey, you fill that out. Um, you can get your certificate of attendance. Now, there have been some questions. Do I have to fill out multiple feedback surveys to get one certificate? You can fill out one survey and get all of the sessions that you've watched onto that survey. So if you want to wait till next week to fill out that survey and watch a couple more videos, you can do that. Or you can watch one session, fill it out, get that certificate if you need single certificates per session. So totally up to you and how you want to do it. Um, doesn't matter to us, it's there for you to use. And then we get some feedback on how things went so we can improve for next time. So thank you very much and uh, we'll let you go. Thanks again, John. Yeah, and please contact me if anyone has any questions. Look, look me up, happy to chat. Perfect, awesome, thank you. Bye-bye.